Welcome to In the Classroom, an educational podcast making teaching and learning more transparent. Today I want to spend a, a few minutes talking about Linux as a teacher. I want to basically appeal to those teachers that, uh, that I come in contact with as well as students to provide them some options when it comes to Linux since most of our classes now are transitioning over to teaching and learning more online. Uh, perhaps we're needing to dig out those old computers and a lot of times we can think about using Linux to restore a lot of the capabilities now that some of these older machines still have, still offer, uh, that perhaps are not possible when using Windows or Mac. So if you're thinking about looking at restoring an old computer and you want to bring in maybe a Linux option, a distribution, Today I want to share with you current Linux apps that I'm using and uh, basically showing you that uh, it's quite easy to get around uh, using all Linux apps. All right, so if you have any additional comments or other perspectives regarding today's topic, feel free to reach out to me at my Twitter handle at B-N-L-E-E-Z. If you have additional uh, experiences using Linux, uh, feel free to share those. Today I'm going to basically talk about a lot of different apps, a lot of different ways um, that I go about my teaching practice using different apps that I use, primarily all using Linux apps. In fact, it's all using Linux apps. Some of it's freeware, open uh, source, um, some of it's propri proprietary uh, applications. Most of them are free. There are a couple of apps that I do pay for that I'll mention as I go through here. But for the most part, all of these apps are free. Now, when you're thinking about different Linux distributions, there are different options, of course. And I think one of the best ways, if you're just getting started and you're not familiar with the different distributions that are available, I would uh, visit DistroWatch. And if you notice here along the right-hand side of your screen, a list of, I believe, 100 different distributions uh, that are available. I've tried probably 15 to 20 of these and many times. And uh, the, the distro that I'm going to be talking about today is going to be Linux Mint. And I think for new users, there are several options, I think, are, that are good for new users. But I think Linux Mint specifically is at the top of the list. And um, I'm going to go into why I think this as I go into some of the apps. Because some of the apps that I'm using are going to be very specific to my teaching context. right? So if you are uh, considering using Linux and... Uh, you work at the same university, uh, you may want to consider this di uh, distribution uh, so that you don't run into some, some problems later on. And of course, it will depend too on the, your hardware. So it's going to depend a lot on uh, the equipment that you're using and of course the apps that you're going to need, uh, not only for your own teaching practice, but perhaps even uh, with your students. Okay. So Again, I'm going to be talking primarily to teachers, but of course, students should also be considering a lot of the apps uh, that I'm talking about here, because a lot of the platforms that I, I'm going to be sharing, uh, they will you will be accessing and uh, be needing to 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 go into to uh, take part in the classes that you have with your teachers. All right, so Linux Mint, they basically have four different versions. Uh, they have three listed here. Cinnamon, uh, Mate, and XFCE. So essentially, if you have an older machine with uh, lower RAM requirements, XFCE tends to be a little bit lighter. Uh, Cinnamon is the desktop environment that I have currently installed on my computer. But let me show you my specs here. A um, lot of information here, but essentially, let me provide an, uh, let me see if I can get a better view here of my system info. Uh, this computer is a MacBook Air and it is almost 10 years old. It was a 2011 model 
Um, but it's certainly not the slowest machine out there. So, but, you know, still by really having all the apps that I have currently installed, you'll notice here at the bottom, I've got OBS, which I'm using to record and stream this uh, video. It's uh, that's running in the background. I have Microsoft Teams, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes, which takes up some uh, resources. I have a Thunderbird, so my email client is also open. Of course, I've got Chromium up. I also have NSYNC, which I'll talk about as well. But just to show you, I've got a lot of different apps here running in the background, and I'm currently only at four and a half. Uh, gigabytes of uh, RAM. And uh, the CPU is, of course, it's running relatively high, but it's not at 100%. So when you're deciding again on the distribution, and I've tried, you know, many different distributions uh, in under Linux, and, you know, the it's it's about trying to find the good balance between the operating system that still offers, that gets out of your way, that doesn't take up so many resources that if you're going to have a lot of apps in the background, that's going to be a consideration. It's quite different if you're only going to have a browser open or maybe an email client, right? Uh, maybe, maybe you don't even use an email client, but all of these apps take up space. And um, in my particular case, I've had more issues with CPU than I've actually had with RAM. But if you go with, uh, for example, Ubuntu distribution, okay, I'll go back here to DistroWatch. This is one of the more popular uh, distributions here, this Ubuntu. This has the GNOME desktop, and this takes up a lot of uh, resources. And I, I, can't, I can't run Ubuntu and still run all of the apps that I want and still get a decent performance. So you are going to need to be selective if... Your resources are limited, but again, it's going to depend a lot on how how many apps you have open and how many you need to to have running in the background simultaneously. All right, so Linux Mint. Here we have three different versions. You can certainly go online and get more information about these uh, three options, and you can see what they look like and and even test them out. Um, this video is not to go into that, uh, uh, to all the ways of installing uh, the distributions. You can certainly find that information online. What I want to try to do today is just give you an overview of what is possible running Linux as a teacher. All right, they have another fourth version here. This is Linux Mint. This is just essentially a Debian edition where they just run Cinnamon without Ubuntu. Uh, but I've had uh, issues with, with that distribution. All right, so again, for me, the best option is uh, Linux Mint, in, in this case, 19.3, the Cinnamon version. All right, so moving on. So here, basically, the different apps that I'm using, I talked about Microsoft Teams. So the way that I run classes is I have class five hours a week with my learners. I have three classes, and they all meet one hour a day, Monday through Friday. So our class that we used to have face-to-face -face now meets online. I started off the semester using Microsoft Teams and using the meeting func function within Microsoft Teams, which works very much like Zoom, but there are a few limitations. And so because of these limitations, I've had to... Um, also use Zoom. And one of the limitations for Linux machines is that it does not give you an option when you open up the meeting, when you want to share a video, to also include the audio in the meeting. It doesn't include the audio of the, the video that you're uh, playing. Right? So for example, if I open up a meeting, I have students come in, and I want to play a video, a YouTube video, for example, there's no way for them to hear the video. And so that's not good. I don't, and that's one of the reasons why I don't use the meeting feature within Microsoft Teams. Another limitation, or I guess I should say a feature that Zoom has that uh, the meeting feature doesn't have within Microsoft Teams is that there is um, 
There's no way to randomly assign students into breakout rooms. Now, here under Microsoft Teams, you can create a channel which serves as a breakout room, which is nice. You can have them go into uh, these rooms, but there's a lot of legwork involved in setting that up because you have to first assign the students into these rooms and then notify them which rooms that they're in and it, it's just a lot of it's just a lot of work and if you want them to change or if you just want them to uh, if you want to randomly assign them to different breakout rooms you can't do it within Microsoft Teams one of the things i really like about zoom is that you can designate how many breakout rooms so you can estimate very quickly in seconds how many are going to be how many students are going to be into each breakout room and you can assign them on the spot so feasibly every day you could assign different small groups so that they have more of a chance to work with each other so it's not always the same uh, groups that are that are working so basically for those two reasons I'm using zoom and I'm currently uh, do pay for one of their uh, you know, for, for the service so that it, uh, so that I, I have that capability and I don't have a limitation of 40 minutes. So Zoom is what I'm using for meeting with my class every day uh, in live sessions. And I compliment that, uh, that face-to-face -face contact or online, but that, that live feature, I complement that with uh, the Moodle that we have set up. Now, this is not the course the Moodle course that that I'm currently uh, using with my students, although it looks very similar, um, because currently our servers are down, they're doing some uh, updates. But I we complement this so that all of the assignments and attendance and many of the activities and the forums and the chats that we conduct are going through the virtual classroom. Again, essentially a Moodle that has been set up. And so basically between Moodle and the Zoom app, what students and I are working together and, and I'm providing feedback and both synchronously and asynchronously, both live and, and also through forums over time uh, through the activities that they're asked to, to complete. Many of the activities are done in class and, and in, our, in our live sessions. So a lot of times we'll be in the zoom session and then we'll go into the virtual classroom and we'll do some activities and many times we'll come back or sometimes they'll be in the virtual classroom and we'll be conversing uh, via zoom i just like the flexibility sometimes we just work all, only in zoom and then later they'll go into the virtual classroom to do some sort of activity so there's a lot of flexibility in how we work in terms of uh, the live sessions and what we want to accomplish in those live sessions because again I think the contact with students and having them be able to converse online with each other as well as with me I think is still important so we don't lose that so it doesn't turn into just as simply an asynchronous experience that we still have that live component that is so very important uh, in a face-to-face -face class so now we're basically trying to incorporate those two aspects, asynchronous and synchronous learning, through essentially the, these two platforms. These are the main platforms. Of course, there are other websites that, that we're using. We're using all kinds of videos, both videos that I produce as well as videos that already exist in YouTube, for example. And so whether they access the videos through our live sessions or through the virtual classroom, other websites and technologies are being used to access the course content and to interact with course content and interact with themselves. One thing I failed to mention about Microsoft Teams, and, and I, I probably should go into a little bit more what Microsoft Teams is, or at least how I approach using it, because I only use a very small percentage of, of what it's capable of doing. But one of the things that I particularly like about Microsoft Teams is that it has a very good uh, mobile app, both for cell phones, Android phones, and iPhones, but also iPads. And it's very functional, very easy to use. One of the things I really like about Microsoft Teams, other than the fact that you can 
post openly. You can create a team per class, which is what I've done here. I have a, a class this semester called Grammar and Context 2. So you'll notice here along the top, the first tab uh, under post is where we all post messages. So I can share information and provide feedback to the whole group. And of course they can respond. And there are all kinds of dynamic activities that you can do just through that feature, that one feature, these open posts. But if students need to contact me or need to contact themselves more privately, such as like maybe if they wanted to send an email, I'm asking them instead of an email to send me messages via the chat. And um, I won't go into the chat at this moment, but what I like about the chat is that it's organized by individual. So it will keep a running total of all the chats and all the prior uh, communications that we've had. And so it's much easier to keep track of information versus accessing maybe an email where maybe I would have to go and search for a prior conversation with the same person. Here in chat, it's organized by person. So again, it just makes it a lot easier to uh, go back and access those conversations. And there's an activity tab here. This is just good for any type of activity across Microsoft Teams to keep track of that information. I mentioned earlier I have teams set up, so every class I have is a team. And here I'll show you, it's a little laggy right now. So I'm basically using half my RAM, so still not a major issue, but you'll notice the CPU is jumping up a little bit, and that's presumably because now I'm moving around in Microsoft Teams. And, um, you know, the CPU is, is still going to be a slight limitation for this particular computer being almost 10 years old. And I guess I could close some apps in the background. Again, it's a little bit laggy because I've been, I'm recording and I'm streaming at the same time using OBS. So, of course, it's going to be a little laggy. These are the different teams that I currently have set up in Microsoft Teams. Writing Workshop is a class that I'm teaching this semester, and I have two groups, Grammar and Context 2. It's basically one, the same class, but two different groups. So I have set up here my classes, and again, each class is set up as a team. And you can see here that I tried setting up breakout rooms, but this was before I really got, uh, got into Zoom and switched over. Um, but again, I still had the same issues that I spoke about earlier. Some of the limitations setting up uh, breakout rooms. I mean, they are possible, and I, I think that they work well for what they do. You can, uh, you know, go into a breakout room and still have posts and files per breakout room. So if you're, if students are doing projects, then maybe this will appeal more to you. Maybe this will be even a, a, an advantage for you using Microsoft Teams and using these channels is what they refer to them to, uh, for, refer to them as. Uh, maybe this even might be a, a, an advantage uh, setting up a breakout room or a channel for students to, to interact in. Um, but here in this case, I've got uh, files next to post, and these are going to be some files that I share. Now, the way that I share files, sometimes I'll share files within Microsoft Teams based on the type of activity. Like, for example, if I'm going to share a Microsoft Word document, I've done this on several occasions where I've created a, a file in the team. And what's nice is I don't have to share the file. All the members, that is the students for the class, all the members of the team in Microsoft Teams will be able to access this shared document. So they can go in and, and make changes uh, in real time. And I'll be able to see all the students at once go in and, and modify that Word document in real time. So that's nice, and that works, uh, that works very well. And other times, I'll upload files in the Moodle in the virtual classroom, uh, depending, like, the, for example, the syllabus. I'll have that included in the, the virtual classroom. And so it's just going to depend. It depends a lot on, on uh, what kind of activities students are doing. I'm just trying to make sure that the... The files that they need to access, uh, they can find it very easily. So it's going to depend on the type of activity that students are doing, where they're at, if they're working more in Microsoft Teams, 
or if they're working more in the virtual classroom, and then just find which platform in this case would it make the most sense to upload and share the file. All right, so here we have along the top, there's a lot of tabs that I don't use. When you set up Microsoft Teams and you set up, you create a new team, you have different types of teams that you can create. And in, and in this case, I selected a class, which probably now in hindsight was a mistake. I should have chosen, uh, there was a, an option for like a, a community, like a, maybe a personal, a community type of uh, team. And, and there's a, a staff team, I think, is an option. But uh, the community team, basically the difference is that you don't have assignments and grades. If you set up a team as a class in Microsoft Teams, you're going to be assigned these tabs here automatically. They're going to create assignments and grades. Uh, I don't particularly like the, f the assignments and grades feature within Microsoft Teams. Okay, I use the grading feature in Moodle in the virtual classroom for all the grades uh, for the class. It's more rob robust, it's easier to use, and it just makes the most sense for, for students to access and, and see their grade, especially when you're dealing with weighted averages, which is what all of my classes uh, have. You know, so all of the assignments are fall under categories, and the, each category is going to be assigned a different weight. So it's just really hard, if not impossible, to do um, here in Microsoft Teams. I, I do believe it is possible, but it you have to really play around with the numbers, and it's it's just more difficult than it needs to be. So I don't use assignments or grades, but I do use in this case uh, a link. It's basically a playlist. All of the uh, live sessions that I have with my learners, I try to get a recording for each of those sessions. And so here, they have access to um, their playlist. And so here, you'll see a list of all of the classes that we've had, um, with the exception of this first video at the top. Not sure what that's all about. But the rest of these are basically prior classes. And uh, one of the reasons why I like this, or like to use YouTube essentially, is because what I do in Zoom is I'll push it out and get a recording automatically from the Zoom class. And then I'll go into YouTube and uh, I will remove the uh, parts of the video where I wasn't speaking, right? So almost all of our sessions that we have, they're all 50 minute sessions, but sometimes students will be working on an activity where I'm not gonna be speaking, maybe I'm just reviewing their work, or maybe I'm addressing students' uh, questions one-on-one, -on -one, so it's not really part of the class. And so that's why you'll see that in many cases, it's less than 50 minutes, some of the uh, classes, um, because I have gone through and, and removed uh, the parts of the clip where basically there's nothing going on as far as in terms of the video itself. Students are working in their breakout rooms or maybe they're working in the virtual classroom. And so uh, I like to cut out those parts of the video. So if students need to go back to the video for uh, for further reference, that they can go in and uh, you know get to what we talked about uh, quicker. It just makes it easier for them to... to uh, to get to the content. Some of these videos I created in addition to the live classes. So it's, some of them are to orient students on either technologies or different content or um, some of the central questions that we're working on. And if I need to provide additional videos, then I'll also include it here in the playlist. But I like in Microsoft Teams the having the ability to offer these these links and they can see these playlists within uh, the the uh, the platform itself. If we look at the other class I'm teaching this semester, grammar and context, so we can also go and and see Prope A videos, Prope B videos. Remember, I have it's basically the same class, but I have two different groups. So every each group will have their own video, and here they'll be able to see again their playlist for all the prior classes that that we've had. 
Okay, and again, in most cases, not all of them, but some of them are less than 50 minutes. And in this case, many of them are uh, almost 50 minutes or sometimes even uh, slightly more. Um, this class is for uh, first semester students just getting into the university. Actually, this is their second semester, but their first year of study. Uh, they're typically at an A2 level, according to the Common European Framework. The writing workshop, those students are roughly at a B1, B2 level. And so uh, it's, it's a slightly different dynamic, classroom dynamic and, and uh, exchange when uh, comparing these two different groups when uh, you're looking at these live classes that we're offering online. Um, so this would explain, and also just the nature of the course, um, it's uh, a little bit different. So these are decisions you're going to make if uh, you are offering classes online or if you need to offer classes online. Uh, again, the point here is that all of this is in using Linux. Okay, so some of this, of course, is proprietary software. Microsoft Teams is proprietary software. And, you know, I think it's important to mention here without getting too much in the weeds, when you apply or you install apps in Linux, especially in Linux Mint, but yeah, there's there's different ways that you can install apps. And when you look at the app store here, let me open up the, the app store here. The some apps you have to kind of look in different places. So Microsoft Teams app, uh, we'll get to it here in a second. Guess where it's opening up? Again, the system's bogged down just a little bit. Probably the CPU is, yeah, of course, 100%. So again, you'll see here, memory's not really an issue here. It's just going to be a CPU bottleneck, basically. And um, I think if you have a newer machine, of course, you'll have less issues, I think, with CPU. But here you'll notice that in this uh, software manager, uh, they have this option of flat pack. All right? All right. So if you want to install Microsoft Teams, you're going to need to go under the flat pack option. And here, just type in. They actually have two different Microsoft Teams apps. I always install the 1.3 version, the most recent version. It has a few more, um, at a few more options available to you. It has a little bit more functionality than the older version, which is I think 1.0 version. So again, if you have issues with one, of course you can try the other. You'll see here. Basically, these are two. The these are the same apps, but this one offers a few more options in terms of uh, setting up your devices and um you know it's but it but they're both they both work uh, very well and uh, the only way you're going to be able to find this app is by selecting uh, flat pack all right and again this is just a lot easier to do if you use a different distribution a lot of times flat packs you can install by going to flat hub and installing the app that way but again, this just makes it a little bit easier to, to use the software manager here in Linux Mint, clicking on flat packs and going to the app itself. But if just to show a comparison, if I were to type in Microsoft Teams here and do a search, let's see what pops up. I'll wait for it. My guess, okay, it does pop up. All right, that's interesting. Sometimes uh, apps don't pop up, or I just remember in having issues trying to find apps. Um, but in this case, it's nice. So it doesn't matter where you search, it's going to search automatically the flat pack option. But just remember when you click the option, I'm not sure. Let's see if I could do another search for Caden Live. This is a video app. 
that I've used a lot in the past, but have recently decided to discontinue. I'm going to be using a different video app that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, it's called Shotcut. So if you go into videos here, Shotcut. It's a really good uh, video app if you need to edit videos. Yeah, so here you'll see that uh, there's a Caden Live Flat Hub and then a Caden Live Regular. And so here, a lot of times, it's just a matter of really experimenting with the different versions to see which one works best for your <clears throat> hardware, for your computer. And um, so that's why a lot of times you'll see more than one version of the same app. A lot of times there'll be a flat pack version. And uh, But you'll notice here that there are a lot of different categories and there's just a lot of apps uh, that you have access to and um, yeah so here let's continue on so Microsoft uh, Teams this is basically how I'm using it uh, I basically only use Teams chat the activity feature is useful I'll use a calendar to schedule meetings like some of my teams are research based so I'll have a research a team and if I want to schedule a meeting with colleagues I can go into the calendar and set up a, a meeting and a lot of times when I really don't need the extra functionality of Zoom the meeting feature within Microsoft Teams works perfectly well it's uh, it's uh, it's it's all I need really to uh, to converse and communicate and share my screen and and uh, get done what I need to get done online so so I, I do use the team, uh, the meeting feature within Microsoft Teams. All right. Now, some of the apps that I'm using very quickly, those who are into research, I uh, use Mendeley. And you're probably familiar with Mendeley, but it's a citation reference uh, manager. You can bring in PDF files of all these articles. I have well over 100, probably over 200 articles um, for uh, based that I've used for for research, I used it for my dissertation. I'm using it currently with other colleagues. And what's nice is that you can set up groups and bring in articles and make annotations to those articles and share those annotations and notes with colleagues. And so that's what I've done here, where I've got uh, a current project for next year with different subfolders with different related articles and some of them will have notes and annotations and uh, it's just an easy way to communicate uh, with colleagues if you're sharing ideas and notes and questions about particular aspects of uh, these articles so you can highlight the text which is what I've done here and um, it all works perfectly well here on uh, in Linux I mentioned the video shortcut is a very good um, app for editing video. So if you're going to be creating video or if your students are going to be creating uh, videos, uh, this is a really good app. There's several apps for video uh, production that are available, but this one's fairly straightforward. Still has plenty of functionality with effects and filters, and you can do a lot of things with it. But if you are needing to create video for your classes, this is a good app. If you need to create audio, you can also use Audacity. Okay, this, uh, they have apps for Windows and Mac, but of course they also have it for Linux. And this is an, another app that I believe there are several versions. Uh, as we saw earlier with Caden Live, uh, you, can, you can see here this is... See which version this is. 2.3.3. All right, so this is Audacity. and still opening up the software manager. I use FreeOffice. I like FreeOffice. It's um, my preferred uh, office suite. And one of the things I like about FreeOffice is that it automatically comes with a lot of the fonts, Microsoft fonts. But one of the things that I would recommend doing also is installing an app called MS Fonts. I think it's MS Fonts Installer. 
We'll see this here in a minute once the software manager opens up. But the main thing is to make sure you have the Microsoft fonts already installed. So let me first check out Audacity. You go into Audacity, you're likely to find more than one app. Again, one app's going to be in a flat pack, which is what I currently have installed, and then an older version in their regular repository. All right, so here we have uh, the flat, they say flat hub, flat pack version, and then this is the older version here. So you can decide which one, and typically the older version will have more reviews, and uh, you could maybe argue that it's more stable, but it's just a matter of trying both and see, finding out which one works best for you. Now, I mentioned earlier fonts, and one of the apps I would also install when you first uh, install the distribution is this MS Core Fonts Installer. So one of the things that you have to be careful about is if you don't have the right fonts installed when you're opening up uh, when you're opening up files from your students, if you're if you don't have the same fonts as your students, then the formats get really crazy. And so it's always best to make sure that you've installed the the fonts. This app already installs most of the normal fonts or the common fonts fonts that students are using already. So you're probably going to be all right even without not installing the app that I mentioned, but I like to install both just to have all the fonts in there, so to not have problems uh, with, um, you know, with having uh, formatting problems when you're opening up a student file. Now, I will say that uh, if you're using, uh, or yeah, if you're writing documents or having students write documents according to APA, then you're basically only going to need about four or five fonts that are acceptable now in the new edition of the publication manual, uh, like Calibri and Arial, Arial, and Times New Roman still is acceptable. There are a couple of others that now that are acceptable that weren't acceptable before, but I believe that all of those fonts should be in this app already. I haven't checked all of them, but uh, they should all be here. And uh, you should not have problems if students are using those common fonts, especially the fonts that are now acceptable or the only ones that are acceptable according to the current publication manual for APA, the seventh edition. And of course, they have the whole suite here. So if you need a PowerPoint, you've got presentations. And it's close enough. I've used it enough to where there's really no issues here with uh, formatting. LibreOffice is also very robust and a very good app. So d double check that also if you're if you're wanting uh, to use a different uh, suite. Now there is an app here that I do pay for, and this is called NSync. And uh, our university, our, we're using Office 365, so we're we have an Edu account. And what I like about NSync is basically it syncs folders and files to my lo to my computer and it allows both a Google Drive account and a OneDrive account but a OneDrive uh, edu account not just a personal Microsoft account but also a, a business account or a, an Office 365 edu account so that's what I've done here I have essentially selected different folders to sync to my local computer so you notice here I've got some folders in the A folder, and I have some subfolders in the B folder listed here. So if I open up, if I open up my folder, you'll see under in sync, under A and B, I have some. These are the two folders that I have set up. And so I don't have all of the folders that I in my OneDrive uh, synced here because I don't have a lot of space on this computer. So this is nice because I can go each semester and change and modify which folders I want to sync and unsync uh, as uh, as needed. So not to again take up all of my uh, drive space for this computer. And I can apply this to other computers like my office. A computer I also have it installed 
but it, it is, um, it's not free. There's a one-time fee. I think it's like 20 or $30 if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but for me, it's uh, worth it because I like having folders and files uh, part in my, fo in my file so that I can easily access these, this information from my computer. I don't have to go to the browser to access it. Of course, I can if I need to, though. And if you're not uh, into syncing uh, in this fashion, then, of course, you can access all of your Office 365 folders via the web browser. All right, and what else? That's basically it. OBS I'm using for streaming and also recording. So if you want to record and create videos, OBS does a great job in recording the video, and then you can bring it into your favorite video edit editor and then create the video, edit the video, create titles. And it's much like Camtasia, but they're just free options. All of these apps are free with the exception of InSync that I just mentioned here and Zoom. And so basically that's what I wanted to share with you today to provide you some options, some kind of a general overview. Again, I didn't go into all of the, the apps, but uh, there are apps that are very specific to what we do at the university. I did forget to mention that there is a VPN for our purposes that also is um, compatible with Linux. And the Citrix receiver is also um, compatible and works just fine. And those of you who know what, what that is and how we use it uh, will appreciate that. If you're thinking about running Linux, you can still get into many of the platforms that uh, you may need to get into uh, as teachers at the university. And so, again, Citrix Receiver, the VPN that we use is available. Uh, I talked about NSYNC. Microsoft Teams, this is uh, something that many of us may be using. Thunderbird Mail, if you need an email client, and Zoom. Of course, you can install Firefox, Web, uh, the Chromium, or even Chrome. If you're partial to Chrome, you can install that. Uh, Brave Browser Works, Opera, Vivaldi, they all work quite well in Linux. And like these, so Rhythm Box is just a music app. You know, a lot of the normal apps here I didn't really go into just because that's fairly standard. Uh, with Linux Mint, they're going to give you most of the apps that you're going to need right out of the box. But the apps that I've been sharing with you today are perhaps a little bit more uh, specific to our context. And again, trying to use what we already have available is one of the... Uh, viewpoints here, one of the things that I'm arguing for basically is what can we use that we already have available to us as uh, teachers at the university and as students at the university, and are they compatible with Linux? And for the most part, they are. If you're into video graphics, uh, there are two apps I don't particularly use, but it's certainly worth mentioning. So if you're into Photoshop, and Adobe Illustrator, then there are two apps here that, or three apps that I'll share with you. Again, I'm not an expert in these apps, but they do exist. And for a lot of the things that you would use for Photoshop and uh, Adobe Illustrator, uh, you can do the same thing with these apps that I'll, I'll show, you with, show you here in a second as it's loading up here. I forgot to mention backups. I also have this backup app that that I use and I haven't set it up yet but I will but it automatically every day will back up my uh, my my files and it will sync it automatically to in sync so it will automatically go to the cloud as a backup so if my computer crashes I can easily restore uh, that information now Let's go to Inkscape. For those that uh, use Adobe Illustrator or vector types of software, uh, basically that are you're editing vector images, Inkscape is probably the, the best option. All right, so they have both a flat hub version, and I just 
heard this week that there's a new version. I'm not sure if this is the latest version. It must be. Um, but I heard, uh, I've heard a lot of good things about the latest version of Inkscape. But again, I don't use it that much, but it is available if you're into design and you need that, uh, that type of uh, software. And then there's Krita for images. This is very much like Photoshop. There's Krita and GIMP. I think GIMP is a little bit more robust than Krita, but they're both, I think, good options and two software uh, packages that I hear a lot about when it comes to editing images. And this would be, uh, again, there's two versions of Krita here. And GIMP, GIMP's been around for a long time. And again, I think GIMP is a little bit more robust. I think it has a few more features than Krita. Um, but again, it's just a matter of going into those. And, and those of you who know more about these apps will be able to look and, and know uh, very quickly if, if they're working out for you. But uh, this is GIMP. Okay, again, a lot of different versions, and they have a lot of plugins and textures, a lot of filters, add-ons that are available. Okay, so I, I did want to mention those because, again, if you're thinking about moving over to Linux and, and that's a concern, then uh, you might want to take a look at those apps. Uh, Steam is here. VLC for video is very popular. Skype, of course. Google Earth. Dropbox. TimeShift is a backup software program, very much like uh, my Apple's Time. What is it? TimeShift or TimeShare or something? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but it's very similar in that it saves incremental backups. So yeah, that's basically it. Uh, again, this is an appeal to my colleagues, those who are looking for an alternative to Windows and Mac and curious whether or not a Linux setup like this, um, this is all Linux that I'm using, and whether or not this is possible. And for my particular case, it is possible. And uh, of course, I haven't talked about dual booting, so you could feasibly install both, have a Windows and a Linux installed on the same computer, and then each time you boot up the computer, you could go into Windows or, or Linux. Uh, I don't do that, but certainly that is an option as well if there are certain apps that you just must uh, use. There's a, there are apps within Linux like Wine, which will allow you to open up Windows uh, apps in Linux. And I haven't gone into that. I don't use those, but they are available. But again, basically looking to see what we can use that we have available both in terms of the platforms as teachers and students at the, at the university what do we have available to us already what equipment do we have available what options are there in terms of operating systems and apps and platforms that are are freely available that are open to the public that are very functional and today i hope that i've shared with you some options not to say that this is the only way or even the best way to set up uh, this particular type of uh, hardware and software or configuration, but to basically show you that there are options. And if you have additional comments or questions, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter at B-N-L-E-E-Z. If you have additional insights and uh, suggestions as to what types of apps work well in the teaching field, I'm, I'm very much interested in both, uh, you know, formal educational uh, context, both from the teacher standpoint and also from a learner standpoint. And if you are teaching at the university and you're using some of these apps, I am really curious to hear your experiences. So. Feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in uh, discussing your setup and or if you have questions, if I can help, I uh, certainly will. We'll see you in the next video.